this video comes with a pretty hefty content warning, so once again I'll put the list of sensitive discussion topics on the screen for you. Now most people won't find any of these things worth missing out on the video for, but if any of them are things you'd rather not expose yourself to right now, there's no shame in sitting this one out. And that includes if, in a broad sense, you'd rather not see me get political when I talk about socioeconomic systems, the role of one's speech, and generally things that fall outside of funny person watches a show and makes jokes. Incidentally, I'm not going to be making as many jokes this time around. I'm actually talking about a couple of shows that I consider to be good comedy, so I'm more or less going to let them speak for themselves and just pepper in my own analysis. You'll also notice there isn't an alternative clean version like there normally is. And that's because the nature of what I'm going to be talking about falls far outside of what's considered family friendly, in case the warnings weren't hint enough. And that's even considering my incredibly loose standards. You know, my mom stopped watching the clean version of the Kickin' It Old School video partway through because of my censored F-bomb. Making a clean version would not only be cumbersome to edit, but I don't think it would have the impact that I want it to. And not to spoil, but one of the shows that I'm talking about is centered around sex, and it'd be silly for me to take something like that, dissect it, and then try to make something that you can say afterward, here, here's something you can show to a grade schooler. So, sorry for the inconvenience. You've been warned. And now that you're all suited up, it's time to go in. We're headed to an awful place. A place where only the most disgusting of animals spend their days and only the lowest among them venture to find anything of value. Most call this place YouTube. Perhaps in a twist of irony, this episode will one day be shown on a glimmering utopian video platform where viewers watch what they want, creators are adequately compensated for their efforts, and none of it is dependent on a fickle corporation in an ever-fluctuating market. But until then, this video lives on YouTube. You know it, you know its problems, you know how it functions, and if you don't know these things, there are much more eloquent people who would be happy to explain it to you. One well-known effect of the platform is that over time, the algorithms that determine what people watch and engage with tended to bias toward users that could generate longer videos with catchy titles the most frequently. One kind of user that could meet this criteria while also paying for fancy branding and promotion from YouTube themselves was the corporate user. Record companies, TV studios, and the celebrities who service their product could easily push their videos to an audience for free. Well, not technically free, but for the low cost of watching an ad or two. Or three on a device that someone spent money on, on an electricity bill that somebody pays for, using an internet connection that somebody pays for, in a home that somebody either pays rent for or taxes on or maybe both, but otherwise free. And not fully exempt from this trend sat The Onion, a satirical news organization. The work produced by The Onion has ranged from print media to BuzzFeed-style articles on their website ClickHole and tons more. The Onion Digital Studios received a grant from YouTube to produce a number of series in 2012. Some of their notable series from the time included Onion News Network, a parody of most 24-7 news networks. Hey, and Republican vice presidential nominee Paul Ryan hit the streets of Columbus, Ohio to visit with the city's homeless and clarify his economic position that they did this to themselves and have no one else to blame. Onion Talks, a clear satire of TED Talks. And of course, the biggest question of all, what is the biggest rock. But how do you find the biggest rocks? You go places and ask. Trouble hacking and more. Now that you have that rubber strap, you, you can keep the rubber on the bottom of your feet when you go outside. As you can see, my feet are perfectly protected. Today I'd like to cover a few. We'll take a look at a couple of them very briefly and then turn our attention to one that I think is worth exploring in depth. We'll start with one of my favorites and see what kind of treasure we can unearth from this putrid lake we call YouTube. In this episode, we'll see what's coming up from under East Bay. Halcombe County Municipal Lake Dredge Appraisal, or just Lake Dredge Appraisal, stars actually kind of notable actor Christian Stolte as David Kim Parker, whose televised job is to appraise the many items presented to him that have been dredged out of a lake. Like, immediately following being dredged out of a lake. All right. Now what you have here is a collection of chicken wire and, and lake debris. Mm -hmm. You see how there's this loose wire here? Okay, I see it. It might be obvious right from the start that stylistically, this show is trying to emulate programs like Antiques Roadshow, right on down to the nostalgic VCR filter. But while Antiques Roadshow is the closest thing I've seen to what Lake Dredge Appraisal does, there's something undoubtedly off. 
The pacing isn't meant to emulate Antiques Roadshow at all. It's much slower, more deliberate, and undeniably awkward in the best way. It's also fairly low budget, as most of the scenes take place in front of this foldable table in what looks to be a public space. It's nice to see when the comedy is strong enough that the bulk of costs likely went to the actors and on-set crew, rather than overly fancy editing and expensive props. I mean, except for that one episode where Kim appraises a hundred iPhones. Those must be recycled, right? Or made of something else? They wouldn't pour their grant money into a half-assed joke about smartphones, right? Not to say that spending money in those areas is necessarily a bad thing, iPhones notwithstanding, but I dig simplicity, and simplicity is absolutely where Lake Dredge appraisal shines. The show is full of incidental segments, like these info cards that sporadically appear, and the occasional memorable dredge. One time, I dredged a cage full of live chicken. Don't know how they got down there, or how they stay alive. It's all made to appear low budget, like something you might expect from a local TV station in a rural area. The VCR filter juxtaposed with a clearly 2010s era Mountain Dew can, which Kim claims is from the 1990s. Idiot. And further juxtaposed with iPhones. I sure I'm bringing up those iPhones a lot. You'd think I was about to critique capitalism or something. It creates this strange, otherworldly feel to the show. Like, we know going in that it's fiction, but it drives that even further with this glaring and deliberate incongruence. The other thing this show does, like most things The Onion puts out, is showcase a vague kind of world building. I've never taken the time to dissect the serious lore of The Onion, but there always seems to be a second layer to the parody. See? Onion? Layers? Most satirists will take the thing they're critical of, exaggerate it up to 10, call it out, and call it done. But with The Onion, rather than spoon-feed the joke to the audience, they let them fill in the blanks and let that speculation kind of be its own entertainment. It makes them feel uncomfortable for not having all the information, and then amused that it's an unsolvable problem with an absurd premise. Here are some clips that showcase what I mean. Come on, Pete, this belongs to me! It belongs to whoever dredges it out of the lake. That's Dredger's Law. I am quite familiar with Dredger's Law, but... No, oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, these are coins. Yeah, what are they worth? I have already said more than I should. Please just take these to a coin appraiser before I land myself in any more hot water. I can't. Okay. I think I'm ready to give my appraisal. The show has run out of time, and the pen appraisal will be completed next week. The fascinating thing about Lake Dredge appraisal is that it seems to leave behind more questions than answers. What is Dredger's Law? Who gets to be part of the guild? How much is Virgil's pen worth? Tune in next week to find out. I recommend watching Lake Dredge appraisal if this kind of humor is your thing. It's deliberately bizarre, and I don't think you'll walk away from it the same as you arrived. The episodes are procedural, so you can watch any one on its own, but there is some progression that happens, so watching in order will give you a different experience. It's 53 minutes altogether. This next series is bound to fill you with existential dread and make you forget about everything you once thought beautiful. It's time we took a hard, cynical look at this horrifying planet. Horrifying Planet is a series of nature documentary parodies with a nihilistic twist. Episode titles include The Desert Where Nature Goes to Die, Animals Spread Disease Constantly, and Spiders. Christ fucking spiders. Ugh, oh, fucking spiders. Fuck! Each episode looks at an aspect of the Earth we live in with a harsh and often crass outlook. Our planet is but a giant petri dish swirling with pathogens, all mixed by the filthy stirring straw that is the world's fauna. When the show's at its best, the blunt delivery is matched only by its painful accuracy. Though remember, this is just for entertainment, and not a substitute for real education. And the same goes for actual nature documentaries. Watching a video on a topic does not make you an expert on that topic, no matter how well researched that video may be. I didn't know what a tidal pool was until I watched Horrifying Planet. There's not a punchline to that, I'm just letting you know that I'm an uneducated piece of shit because that's gonna be important for later. Most episodes have something special to offer. There's one about Robins that goes Godwin's Law pretty quickly. Even the most depraved acts of humanity pale in comparison to the Robin's wickedness. The Spiders one I mentioned is shockingly poignant, and it's possible that the episode Deer Are Fine is a critique of the, to be fair, media approach. 
From an evolutionary perspective, there is certainly nothing wrong with deer. After the tone of the show has already been set, it seems like the narrator tries to put a positive, or at least neutral, spin on deer that, in his own words, come off as trying too hard. Which isn't a criticism of the satire. I think they did that on purpose to show how bizarre it is when artistic analysis gives credit to something that works against its thesis. A common thread in my series has been that I'm willing to talk about the good and bad parts of media, so maybe the deer episode is speaking to me personally? I've never felt so attacked by deer! Except for that one time. A notable episode of Horrifying Planet is the one on natural gas. It's an episode that's clearly sponsored by an oil company that talks about fracking in a shockingly positive light. And valuable gas is sucked up through a friendly hose. It is the solution to the global energy crisis. The episode speaks in such absolutes as if it were the authority on the matter, and the language they use is so purposefully written to get you to believe fracking is ultimately a good thing. Now this is funny jokey time and all, but you know who else does literally all of these things in real life? Good old P.U. PragerU is a YouTube series that's funded by a literal fracking company, and their rhetoric does all of the things this episode of Horrifying Planet does. They use demonizing language for things they don't like, and flattering omissionary language for things that they support. Hell, they even have an episode called Why You Should Love Fossil Fuel, where all of the consequences of fracking and other practices like it are summed up as some negative byproducts, while the positives of having energy at all are rattled off in this laundry list. And each of these things is something that could have been just as possible, and still is, with renewable energy. None of them are unique to fossil fuels, even though the thesis of the video is, fossil fuels are good. I'm going to stop talking about PragerU now, because just thinking about them is making me want to drink bleach. And speaking of bleach, there's actually an episode of Horrifying Planet that you won't find on The Onion's YouTube channel. If you watch the entire 11 episode series, you'll notice it lacks a sense of finality. And that's because there was originally a 12th episode to cap off this depressing dive into the worst things nature has to offer. The finale was called Horrifying Planet, How to Destroy It. This episode proposes that the world is such a dreadful, terrible place that it's in everyone's best interest if we destroy the planet by dumping bleach everywhere. The narrator suggests applications of bleach ranging from simple to outright absurd in an attempt to eradicate all life, humans included, from the earth. By creating a false seal using a large black balloon filled with bleach, one can imagine pretty easily giving a polar bear a hefty mouthful of bleach. The reason the episode was removed might seem obvious. Of course you don't want to have a video on the internet telling people to kill the environment and themselves with bleach. But to others, it's not so straightforward. You might ask why there's a need for self-censorship. This is satire, is it not? Isn't satire exempt from responsibility? Is this the work of the humorless SJW cuck police who are always triggered by things that are just jokes, just memes, and just trolling? Well, in a word, no. It's because The Onion, as it turns out, has standards. Here are some of the underlying reasons I think The Onion chose to remove the finale from the series. For starters, it doesn't have proper warnings about suicide. The narrator toward the end encourages viewers to kill themselves by consuming bleach. Once non-human life has been utterly destroyed, we shall turn the bleach on ourselves. At midnight March 15th, 2020... Hey, that's right before Animal Crossing New Horizons comes out. Clearly there's a good reason to live past that point. And while it might seem intuitive to think, well, it's obviously satire, no one would actually do it. People actually have. Drinking bleach, for all of the memes and jokes there are about it, is something that no small number of people have actually done to end their lives. And there have even been cases of people forcing others to drink bleach to murder them. And the worst part is that most of the people who do try to kill with bleach fail. I mean, it's good that they survive, but typically excruciatingly painful damage is done to the internal organs long before the bleach becomes fatal. And an excess of pain is the last thing a suicidal person wants. Meanwhile, the horrifying planet finale weaves an image of bleach that implies it's a quick, efficient solution to the problem of diverse life. A person who's already experiencing a level of existential dread could watch the episode and see this as a potential solution to the problem that is their own life, even if they know it's satire. 
because satire is always based in truth to some degree. And beyond that, the episode could equip a bioterrorist with ideas about applying bleach in ways that may not accurately have the effects Horrifying Planet proposes, but could still do very real and lasting damage to the environment. Again, that's even if they know it's satire. Actual, tangible damage to human lives and to the ecosystem isn't something that The Onion wants to be associated with, so I think it was wise for them to remove the episode. I only have the footage because another user re-uploaded it to YouTube at time of writing. And even as I put this video together, I'm asking myself, but wait, you are also showing parts of this episode and talking about the killing power of Bleach. Aren't you doing just as much potential damage as The Onion by giving out these toxic ideas? What if there's someone suicidal in your audience? And while I think that these criticisms have some validity, I've put warnings in front of my video. And I'd also like to say a couple things outright. First, I do recognize that Horrifying Planet, How to Destroy It, isn't something that The Onion wants to be associated with anymore, so my criticisms should not come as an attack to them. Second, I do not support the use of bleach to harm the environment or to end human lives. In fact, I don't support the premature ending of human lives in general. And if you are someone who has struggled with thoughts of suicide, know that there are people who love you and who understand how you feel. Please don't be afraid to ask for help. I won't dwell on it anymore because I know lots of folks would rather use my videos as a distraction from those thoughts. Horrifying Planet is funny and poignant for the most part, though it does sometimes dip into lowbrow humor, including, but not limited to, rape humor. There's also quite a bit of animal violence, so know that my recommendation comes with a number of warnings. It's 33 minutes altogether. But now we've reached our final stop. We're going to be staying a while in a house of corruption, exploitation, and of course, debauchery. I'd like to welcome you to Sex House. This is Sex House. Welcome to Sex House. Sex House is a parody of reality TV shows like The Real World and Jersey Shore. The intro sequence sums up the premise well enough. Six contestants are invited to stay in a house together and enjoy consequence-free sex, isolated from the judgment of the outside world. The show's first episode, as well as the titles and thumbnails that accompany the whole series, paint a very straightforward picture of what's on offer from Sex House. It's reasonable to think that, since this is The Onion, obviously the point of the show is to crack jokes and make fun of the kinds of people who indulge in reality TV, right? And well, you'd be partly right. But Sex House isn't quite what you might be expecting. Let's start with the housemates. Jay is your typical bro-dude type. You know how parents like to tell their daughters, men only want one thing? Ordinarily, I'd call that toxic and sexist, but if the only man your parents had ever met was Jay, I'd say that that's a reasonable assessment of things. Tara is someone you wouldn't be remiss for calling basic, but let's not call people names. Alex is perpetually horny, so much so that you wonder how much of it is genuine and how much is just playing to the audience. Erin is a rural-born girl who believes Sex House is an opportunity for her to make a special connection with someone for the first time. Derek is a confident, outgoing socialite with a big heart. He also happens to be gay. And lastly, there's Frank. Frank is married with two twin daughters. He says he's in the Sex House because he likes to meet new people. And I'm sure that's all there is to it. I'm not going to have sex with anyone, but meeting new people is always a wonderful treasure. <laughs> The housemates get to know each other a little bit, and when they find the house is well-stocked with drinks, they all get a bit tipsy. Right away, there are a number of problems in the house. Derek is the only gay man in the cast, making him completely incompatible with the rest of the house. Aaron admitting to being a virgin has triggered some predatory reactions out of Jay, so she more or less avoids him. And Frank... well... I mean, he's in his 40s and he's not looking to have sex with anyone anyway, so this reality TV fuckfest is already on track for disappointment. But I'll spoil something for you. One sexual encounter happens before the end of the first episode. And you should know by now, I'm about to spoil the whole series for you. At least just the narrative, not the joke so much. So if any of what you've seen so far sounds enticing to you, know that Sex House comes with a pretty big recommendation from me. Especially if the warnings at the start of this video don't bother you. Plus it's on YouTube, so you can watch it just as easily as you can watch this. I'm not going anywhere, so feel free to check it out and hop back in. For everyone choosing to stay, who do you think is going to have sex by the end of this first episode? If you guessed Jay and Tara, congratulations! You've been coerced by reality television. No, the lucky couple is Aaron and Frank. 
Both of them have far too much to drink, and even after Frank says some very alarming things to Aaron, the two of them go upstairs and get it on. Sex House may have you believe that's the whole story. An unexpected pairing go off and have sex because they've had too much to drink. But consider this. Frank is already married, so unless Sex House was something that he and his wife had discussed prior or they were in an open relationship that allowed for such encounters, that's one red flag. Jay says that Frank stole his virgin, which if you don't see how that's a problem, I'm afraid I can't help you. Derek says it's wrong because Aaron is half his age, although Alex asserts that they're both adults and they can do what they want, which I happen to agree with. But what really makes this nefarious is in a concept called dubious consent. Now, dubious consent, or dubcon in erotic fiction communities, describes situations in which the sexual consent of both acting partners is not made explicitly clear. Now, you should know a couple things about my personal view before I go on. First, I believe that sexual encounters should be actively consented upon by both parties. There's no room for sexual assault or predatory tactics as far as I'm concerned. When we're talking about works of erotic fiction, where proper content warnings are used, and the more dubious elements are framed as fantasy elements and not normalized reality, I think that it's okay to write about them to the ends that erotic fiction aim for. Sex House is not a piece of erotic fiction. It doesn't exist for people to get off to. It's satirical comedy, and while I'm sure the writers never intended for it to be scrutinized in this way, scrutiny is what I'm here for. And I think you might take something valuable away from it like I have. Frank knows that Erin is vulnerable. She's sheltered, in a strange new place with total strangers, and has had quite a bit of alcohol to boot. Frank manipulates Erin by telling her how pretty she is, appeals to a sense of erotic taboo by comparing her to his daughters, and establishes himself as friendly and harmless right from the start. These tactics, mixed with the alcohol, are classic coercion maneuvers used by sexual assault perpetrators against their victims. Now, I can't say whether The Onion planned on imbuing Sex House with this kind of depth, but I think the bigger message is clear when you put the pieces together. Frank knew what he was getting into with Sex House, and the I won't have sex with anybody message was a facade. He figured if he could find his way into the bedroom with someone and get the very basic tick mark of she said yes, he could get away with it and still convince himself he's a good person. Aaron said she had a fine time, so there it is. As far as I'm concerned, the issue is closed. The takeaway from my Frank theory isn't just be careful who you trust. Moreover, it's that the people who do heinous things, like manipulate a young person to have sex with them under the influence, are often convinced that they're totally innocent as long as they've done everything by the book. What happened between Frank and Aaron wasn't illegal, but it was dubious. And dubiousness can still be wrong. It's not just villains and the clearly malicious types who do bad things. Sometimes it's the people who seem well-intended on the surface and who genuinely believe they're on the moral high ground. So we're off to a great start with episode one. Episode two picks up the following morning with a congratulatory gift basket filled with food. Food that's suspiciously absent from the house's kitchen. And Aaron's, uh, not doing so great. The show staff, who only make themselves known through a series of sexts on a tablet in the living room, invite the house to play truth or dare. Truth or dare? Mm -hmm. Truth. Who's the youngest person you've had sex with? Can I do dare? <laughs> now this piques my curiosity. Everyone in the house knows that Frank and Aaron have had sex. It's not a secret. So if his answer to the truth prompt were just, Aaron is the youngest person I've had sex with, that'd be the end of it. He'd have nothing to lose. So why would he pick Dare? You might theorize it's because he doesn't want to admit Aaron's the youngest, but that doesn't really make sense. Like I said, if that were true, that'd actually be a good thing for Frank, because that would establish to the house that his encounter with Aaron was an outlier, and he typically engages with people closer to his own age. So why doesn't he just lie then? Well, making up a hypothetical partner who's even younger than Aaron is would definitely paint him in a bad light. And if Aaron isn't a truthful answer, he might still not have gone for it if he's bad at lying. So I'm left with the assumption that Frank has had sex with someone who's even younger than Aaron, and she's barely an adult. Frank's dare is to slip someone the tongue. He admits that doing so with Aaron might be too much to handle, but with the other girls, it might make her jealous. And I really hate to keep stopping the show every time Frank does something, but like, isn't it a little suspect that Aaron's pretty shaken up after the encounter, 
but he still feels a sort of ownership over her, like enough to be invested in not making her jealous. Something to chew on. Derek laments that he's the only gay man in the cast and thus doesn't want to have sex with anybody. You two aren't gay and I'm not attracted to women. I don't even want to be here anymore. <gasps> Tara's dare results in her dry humping Jay and this triggers a panicked reaction out of Aaron. <laughs> As expected, Jay and Tara don't understand how trauma works and Frank feels compelled to be a hero even though his input is really not needed. Frank, leave her alone for once. Even a satire, episode 2 leaves the audience with very normal questions for reality TV. Is Frank ever going to own up to his folly? Will Derek get to leave? How is Aaron going to heal? How much is Virgil's pen worth? Tune in there, Linders. When are Jay and Tara gonna fuck? We're the Jim and Pam of the sex house because everyone wants to know when we're gonna f Well, not in episode 3 because there's a weird smell coming from the house. But they will play Catan! A delivery man brings the housemates a Sibian, which Jay is more excited about than anyone, and Frank's redemption seems as far off as ever. Well, you and I were in the same boat. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't cheat on my wife with a girl half my age. You're disgusting. Derek makes a startling revelation about the house when guests arrive out of nowhere. Camilla is on the scene to teach pole dancing to the girls, and Danny is here to bro out? I'm gonna teach you how to really bro out, you know, get some bro on. Broing out in this context basically means drinking and listening to Danny Vollmer trash talk them. Guys being dudes. Incidentally, and I realize The Onion doesn't have strong profanity restrictions, but I find it funny that they censor the word fuck in every instance except here, when censoring the word pussy was a higher priority. And that is rule number uno, always pluck the p <laughs> Alex definitely wants to fuck Camilla in the p and Tara's not having it. I'm officially done with this girl. But while they feud, a blast of hot air bursts from the vent and Camilla falls and breaks her leg. Like, real, real bad. Camilla is escorted out along with Danny, and something finally clicks for the housemates. We need to figure out how to get out of here, or we might actually die. No, no more games! The little walk that Frank does after tossing the tablet is one of my favorite pieces of acting from this show. All the food from Frank and Aaron's gift basket has gotten moldy, so they stash it all in the upstairs bedroom. Jay and Tara play Catan again, and I'm just now realizing that Catan is a three to four player game, so they must each be playing for two here. Oh, you have got to be kidding me! Once again, Derek's troubling observation is interrupted by a guest. You know me. I'm the host. He's the host, and he's never referred to by any other name. The housemates learn for the very first time that the show has a host, for one, and that Sex House is a competition to see who has the most sex. But before they can comment, it's time for a photo shoot. A gag I find particularly funny is how Jay seems like he'd be a natural fit for the photo shoot since he's an exuberant guy who's very naturally attractive, but they quickly move him over because in spite of that, he's not terribly photogenic. Derek boldly protests the filming of Sex House by drawing Muhammad on his forehead, and while Alex does more of this move, Tara and Jay sneak off to go have sex. Do you mind? Them getting caught and deciding they don't need to have sex for the entertainment of others is actually a pretty heartwarming moment. And when Derek asks them to help display a protest banner, Jay's reaction is really sweet. Absolutely, bro. It says a lot about how the characters grow in this series. In the previous episode, while Jay's still under the illusion that the whole reality TV setup is legit, he gets in a full-on fight with Derek. But now that they both see that there's a larger problem, they can get along, work together, and fight the real threat. Aaron runs off again, and even though Frank is just on the cusp of accepting that his input isn't helpful, Host tells him, go clean up your mess. We're two good people here that just got caught up in kind of a strange situation, and I just need you to tell me that I'm a good person. Frank is so insistent that in spite of his bullshit, he's still a good person. He employs this attitude, but he never fully admits he's wrong about anything. And when he comes close, he always frames it in this way that suggests that it was out of his control or that it doesn't affect his good person status. All he really does is guilt other people for calling him out. And that's shitty. I need you to tell me that I'm a good person. Tell me, please, Diane, tell me that I'm good. But maybe what Aaron has to say will put things in perspective. You got me pregnant. Are you sure it's mine? 
Or not, I guess. A thing I didn't mention is that after most of the episodes, there's a little next time sequence with moments that don't actually happen in the following episode. Like, after this one, the host apologizes for a homeless man breaking in, and it's just never expanded upon. Episode 5 starts with the housemates getting examined by a paramedic, and I just want to say huge props to the makeup team for making them look malnourished. The host's elegant solution to the nourishment problem is to dump a bunch of bananas on the floor for everyone to eat. Problem solved. Meanwhile, Derek's been shackled, and everyone else plays some sexy games to win a single fruit cup. Alex is probably the last house member to crack, so to speak. She's still in this competition and thinks she's got a chance with the host. Do you want to come upstairs with me, sweetie? You can do whatever you want to me. Sorry, I'm not interested. I'm asexual. Host's asexuality is a fun thing to think about. Does this explain why he's so bad at understanding how forced the sexy games are? Maybe. Could he have been the brains behind the show, creating something that seems enticing on paper but in practice doesn't work? Hard to say. Personally, I like the idea that the show staff hired an asexual host so that he wouldn't interfere with the house. I feel like that explanation is kinder to the sensibilities of actual aces than those other assumptions are. Meanwhile, Frank is digging his own grave again. Aaron, please. Please? Now I have to take care of you too? He goes on this spiel about how he cares and he's going to be there for the baby. And the moment the repairman comes through the door, guess who's the first to decide they'd rather be anywhere else? And he does the backhanded apology thing again too. I thought if I escaped, I could send help. If you think about it, it was really very selfless. Host calls Alex repulsive, which, despite Alex's forward attitude, is not a nice thing to say. And in contrast to previous episodes, Tara comes to her defense. Alex is obviously damaged. You can't talk to her like that. Going back to this theme of reconciliation, this is something that I think sets Sex House apart from some of the other Just Jokes and Just Laughs comedy series I've seen. When everything goes to shit, with the network coercing the house into having sex, and the ever-present threat of starvation and disease, there's a twinge of hope. The housemates are suffering, but if they can band together and support one another, there's a chance that they can fight their way out and everything will be okay. In the next episode, the bananas have attracted flies and the room where the food was stored has been completely overtaken by mold. Now that everyone's on board with actively fighting the network, the housemates read off a list of demands. We want someone to take away the trash, the mold, and the flies. We want regular food deliveries, not bananas. The host responds with a tank of frogs to clear out the flies, and the promise that everyone will get to talk to a therapist they've brought in, in exchange for playing a sexy, oily twister. Problem solved. Funny note about this sequence is that they seem to be permitted to call the game Twister outright, but they still have part of the logo covered up on the spinner and the playmat. Anybody up for a sexy game of twists? The therapist's prescriptions are all sex-based, no surprise, even for the pregnant Erin who is diagnosed with a lack and prescribed intimate to orgasm with five refills. Also, Erin was born in the same year as me. The housemates piece together that the therapist is fake, but not before she's begun to have sex with Frank. Yep, we are six episodes in, sex has happened twice, and Frank was involved both times. The host initiates panic mode, and he and the therapist leave the house. For the first time, Frank admits that he's fucked up wholesale. Everything I've done in this house has been a horrible mistake. The next time segment reveals to us that the therapist is now pregnant. And like the other preview segments, it's never revisited again. Episode 7 is... wild, I guess is a good word for it. The sex house is now much more beautiful. The housemates are in a strangely good mood, and they all have water bottles filled with a foggy liquid. Ordinarily, I'm not a fan of the whole, haha, they're on drugs trope. I think it's a little played out, and while the show is guilty of that sort of thing a number of times here, the effects of the drugs are displayed in a more sinister way. There's definitely an element of comedy to seeing characters behaving strangely when they're drugged, but in this case, everyone's behavior is polar opposite of their real personality. Across the board, everyone's lost their concern for safety and health. Alex, who is normally very in tune with her senses, is slow to pick up on things, and has trouble putting her thoughts into words. Frank took me to a room that stabbed my inner breasts. Jay is no longer excited and active, instead choosing to sit and stare into space. Derek is passive and optimistic. More warmth and smoothness to feel on my skin. 
Frank doesn't put on an air of being a moral person, instead being upfront about wanting to have sex with the women in the house. I took Alex upstairs so we could experience each other's bodies. Aaron, who, reminder, is fucking pregnant and being drugged, displays a personality that's not entirely dissimilar to how she was in the first episode, which is a clever way to suggest that she was putting on a front and the cynical, damaged woman she's been is closer to her real self. Really cool writing. Lastly, Tara is erratic and loses her composure when she finds out the drugged up drink kills the frogs. Pretty gruesomely too. They dissolve. The host, who hasn't been drugged, keeps trying to get the housemates to have sex, but they're still not interested. Save for Frank, of course. <coughs> Frank, nobody wants to have sex with you. And when he tries to force a terrified Tara to drink more, she throws the drugged water into his eyes. Ah! I'm blind! <laughs> Once he's been taken away, everyone induces vomiting to get the drug out of their system, and they all take a stand. Let us go! Breathe normally. Prepare for mist. <laughs> Next time on Sex House. Fortunately, unlike the next time segment implies, everyone's still alive, but the implication is that they periodically get misted unconscious if they don't have sex. A big voice on a speaker repeatedly tells them to have sex, so they get smart and talk in spaces where the camera crew doesn't follow them. And just as a quick aside, there is a camera crew following them around the whole time. We as the audience don't know if they're being provided for or not, or if they're free to come and go. I would wager that they're being borderline starved with everyone else, or any developments involving the camera crew have been edited out. Or maybe both. At any rate, the housemates are keeping quiet and out of sight when they can, and when they do talk, it's all about how they're planning a big orgy to appease the network. We can't wait to have a big group sex f fest, and that's why we've all been talking in the corner lately. Alex asks if they can send a repairman for the Sibian, and everyone plays some more Catan to pass the time. I adore the Catan gag, mostly because I love a good tabletop game, but also because it's so strange that the network, which has been providing the housemates with the bare minimum in terms of provisions, gave them a board game that's not exactly cheap and off the beaten Monopoly path. Emma? Karen, I just want you to know your father was a good man. You know, I should have made this a drinking game. If it were, one of the rules would definitely be to drink whenever Frank alludes to himself being a good person. The repairman comes in to fix the Sibian, and the housemates chain him up in the mold room. Everyone grabs tools from his box and starts to break their way out. But they don't get very far before... The network sends in a masked man to literally beat the housemates. This worker beats the sex house into a pulp begin the beating. And just as he's about to bash Aaron with a bat, police baton, a big stick thing, Frank jumps in the way so she can get to the safe room with everyone else. Frank is beaten off screen by the masked man. <laughs> I got him. Frank found an opening to take out the masked goon and the housemates decide to release the repairman, only to find out in the few minutes that exchange happened, the mold spread to his whole body and killed him. And even in the face of all this carnage, the voice on the speaker demands... Have. Sex. <laughs> Episode 9, titled Sex Climax, cold opens with the blurred faces of network executives demanding that the show be shut down and that something be salvaged and put up on the web. It's been a long time since the events of the previous episode. Since the clocks don't work and the housemates can't keep daylight, they've developed their own calendar system. It has been 12 Christs since they left us, but we've built a life here. The masked goon has been kept alive, and the camera crew is acknowledged as having also been abandoned. Jay has taken up growing barley to feed everyone, Tara is the caretaker for the frogs, and Aaron's had her baby, named Danny Vollmer after the comedian in episode 3. The housemates are more united than ever and are making peace with their lives, but Derek's gotten sick, and he's not getting better. And like, it's funny. It's really just funny that Sex House has gotten to this point after its obnoxiously shallow start. The show has stuck with me because of how insane this progression is, and it's all put together in such a way that it's difficult to look away from. The current conflict is that the housemates want to eat the frogs because they might not have enough food to keep Derek alive and everyone's experiencing a protein deficiency. Tara is heartbroken at the thought, but it seems to be the only way to keep everyone alive. Those frogs trust us. They didn't ask 
last are you brought to the sex house? My baby needs protein. Then how are we any better than Tara. just... The housemates gather to sacrifice the frogs, and Jay has to hold back a panicking Tara when they bump into a panel blocking off one of the windows. We should put it back up. Don't worry, we're coming back to this bit. The show abruptly ends when Tara, with a shifted perspective, prepares to sacrifice a frog, declaring, It's a sexy thing to do. And the credits roll in place of a preview segment. At one point, I made a cut of the whole series as a movie. It ends here at just over an hour. It seems appropriate. A bit unresolved, yet complete. My first reaction when it ended was to look up the actors and follow their Twitter accounts because I loved the performances so much. This is such a wonderful piece of absurdist comedy and I was really eager to share my movie cut of it with friends. And then a week later, The Onion uploaded episode 10, Reunion. Six sexy singles. Five. Frank is married, so five. Lived in a house with nothing but booze, beds, and each other. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sex Housemates! And this reunion episode is very hard to watch. Tara says she'd do this experience again in a heartbeat. Aaron shrugs off the pregnancy ordeal. Men of the audience cheer for Frank when they recollect what he did to Aaron. And everyone has some strange where-are-they-now story, all of which involve blogging in some capacity. Derek says he's a heterosexual now, Erin gave up her baby for adoption, Alex got involved with the man behind the mysterious speaker voice, and the host, who's still blind, claims the house mold is an effective vaccine for dengue fever. And everything is so uncomfortably positive. Knowing what happens to these people and who they became during the events of Sex House makes this reunion very unsettling. My movie cut didn't include this episode. It was hard for me to accept that the show ended this way. But episode 10 is important. It puts some things on display that we could benefit from thinking about. I'd like to draw your attention to a Reddit AMA the writers and directors of Onion Digital Studios put together not long after Sex House ended. In this thread, fans asked lots of questions about it and other series, with some interesting replies from the show staff. Lots of the replies are silly things like how the homeless person lived with the cast for the rest of the season and was cut from the show, or how Kim from Lake Dredge Appraisal is Frank's cousin. There are also some interesting behind-the-scenes things that get discussed here, so I'll leave a link to the AMA in the video description. In response to a question about setting the humor of Sex House apart from similar reality TV parodies, writer Chris Sartinsky says, we tried to turn the characters into the heroes, and the house slash host slash producers into the villains. Everyone hates people on reality shows, but they're just nice, dumb people who want to be on TV. Responding to a different question, head writer Sam West adds, The show is very dark, but the whole idea of reality TV, and its proliferation over the last 20 years, reveals some pretty gross stuff about Americans and what they want to see. There have definitely been a ton of reality TV parodies, but if anything, we didn't think any of them were nearly dark enough. A number of fans were thrown off by the reunion episode, and in response to one such commenter, Chris replies, That reunion is very real. Either it shows how even the strongest and most abused participants are eventually sucked into the wretched, hopeless morass of reality television, or else it's just weird. Chris also adds in response to a question about the show's timeline, we never settled on how much time passed between 9 and 10. A few Christs, to be sure. We wanted 10 to be a total reset. In 9, they've given up all hopes of being normal human beings. And in 10, they are well into the only lives now available to them as former reality TV show rejects. They have been destroyed. That is how our comedy web series ends. Beyond these and some jokingly vague comments, the showrunners don't have much to say about the reunion episode, implying that they'd rather leave the ending's meaning, and in fact the meaning of the whole show, up to interpretation. Chris's comment of, or else it's just weird, is a perfectly valid interpretation of its own. I'd like to share mine with you, and why it made a satirical miniseries resonate with me so well. I believe that Sex House is an allegory 
for how capitalism in its current state shapes reality to suit its needs. Most industries under modern capitalism function under the following framework. Business owners buy resources and labor to produce a product for consumers. If they do well, they earn more profit, and with more profit comes more freedom to spend. Particularly in the United States, freedom is seen as the single most noble thing to achieve. Thus, capitalism incentivizes these business owners to do whatever they can to maximize profit and maximize their own personal freedom. With freedom comes power, even when it means paying unethically low wages to the producers of the resources and labor they depend on, or using their excess profit to prevent the government from intervening when things get out of hand. Capitalism encourages people to seek power over the well-being of others. And the thing about power is that those who have it are already at an advantage when it comes to keeping it. So let's talk about Sex House. A faceless network has the short-term goal of creating a product in the form of a reality TV show, but their long-term goal is profit and power. The network foots the bill for some initial investments, a set, a camera crew, and of course some cast members, but these are all bare minimum. The sets fall apart, the crew is eventually abandoned, and they only get six cast members, one of whom isn't sexually compatible with the rest. The network avoids paying for food, safety precautions, internet access, and even first aid to the cast members. Spending less on these investments means bigger opportunity for profit. And because they're already in charge of the production and editing, they can put a positive spin on or even outright omit many of the problems that are happening in reality and depict reality in a way that suits their goals. Now to illustrate this, the Onion deliberately crafted Sex House to make the cracks in the system very obvious. We see the housemates getting starved, drugged, and neglected outright. And in episode 10, it's very clear that something nefarious happened after episode 9. The cast were possibly brainwashed, or more likely paid off, to outwardly suppress the undoubtedly traumatic experience of Sex House. To the studio audience, they paint the whole thing as a worthwhile ride, when reality couldn't be further from the truth. But if the audience sees the whole thing positively, that means they're more likely to give money to the network for these kinds of shows, thus ensuring profit and power for them. And the atrocities the housemates endured don't seem so bad when they conclude this way. Someone could look at that and say, well, they went through starvation and turned out all right, leading them to not take the plight of starving people seriously, or worse, endure starvation themselves and not protest it because they no longer see it as injustice. Doubly so if someone were to make the argument that the housemates were stupid enough to go on a sex-crazed reality show so they deserve it. Ironically, the housemates are the best part of the show. They're wonderfully played characters and the reason to keep watching. Yet the network executives declare the cast are all duds and shift the blame to the housemates for the show's failure. The writers of the satire are making the point absurd enough to notice. You'd think that for something like starvation, there'd be no room to tolerate it in the real world. But what about something like harassment? If you're my age or older, you've no doubt heard of Monica Lewinsky. She was the target of one of the biggest public shamings in the pre-social media world following an affair with then-president of the United States, Bill Clinton. Her name became synonymous with infidelity, being a homewrecker, etc., and countless media organizations profited off of sharing humiliating stories about her and cracking heartless jokes at her expense. Monica struggled to find work or even appear publicly for the two decades that followed because of how widespread this vitriol was. It was a nightmare for her, made worse by the widely accepted notion that because she had committed a wrongdoing, she deserved it. And if I may be so bold, one side effect of this whole ordeal was furthering the normalization of harassment against those that we deem beneath us. It may have taken decades, but Monica Lewinsky is now an anti-bullying activist and has a promising career, which sounds like a very good thing. And for Monica, it definitely is. But even now, I still see her story used as a defense for harassment. I've seen the argument made that Monica Lewinsky deserved to be shamed, and because two decades later she re-emerged in such a positive way, somehow that's evidence that harassing people is a good thing and that it helps them grow. I'm not going to linger on why that's bullshit, because harassment isn't what I'm here to talk about, but suffice to say, I think all harassment is wrong, and all the good things that we associate with harassment, like growth, are things that can also be brought about in more constructive ways. But if we think about this concept in the context of Sex House, it becomes clear what message we can take away from it. That corporations are capable of doing unspeakable things, 
And because capitalism is the ruling mode of operation, they can get away with it by investing in your belief that it's not a big deal. I mentioned before that I showed this to some friends without the reunion episode. I realize now that it was too uncomfortable for me to accept it as an ending. Remember that moment in the show when the window panel falls and instead of leaving, they put it back up? That's the reality for a lot of people. They're broken. They'd rather block things out, even positive things, that would alter the life they know. And when the show released, I'd rather have had the housemates live out the rest of their days united, principled, and finding peace in a space where they're powerless. But over time, I realized why the reunion is such an important piece of the story. The reunion episode is uncomfortable because the rest of the show pulls you in to empathize with the housemates and their struggle under the boot of corporate interest. And when things get so bad for them, you hold on to the hope that they can fight it. That some good will come out of this whole thing. That they'll be able to work together and hold the Power Hungry Network accountable for all the evil that it does. But they don't. How can they? The very system that broke them has persuaded them to turn a blind eye. Partiallyexaminedlife.com defines satire as a technique employed by writers to expose and criticize foolishness and corruption of an individual or a society by using humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule. It intends to improve humanity by criticizing its follies and foibles. And I think The Onion Digital Studios understands better than most how to employ satire effectively. And whether or not we use that satire to improve humanity is up to us. So I'd like to encourage you. Armed with perspective, and rejuvenated by some good jokes, to try and do something that improves humanity. It's the sexy thing to do. This episode was brought to you by the support of no small number of people in no small number of ways, including, but not limited to, LGBTQIA, Hyacinth McCaw, and everyone else who supports me over on Patreon. Thank you. Cause everybody tries to put some love on the line And everybody feels a broken heart sometimes And even when I'm scared I have to try to fly Sometimes I fall, but I've seen it done before I've gotta step outside these walls